So um, this fishbowl is, as, as Tommy already mentioned, on the future of the transatlantic relationship, which of course is a very big beast, um, a, a, a multifaceted relationship, maybe, maybe the one, the most intense one we have uh, on Earth. So it's, uh, we try our level best to, to, <laughs> to, to gauge that, um, but it's of course uh, always only a sort of um, um, a part of the whole which we can, can actually touch on. Um, I think what, what's, what's generally uh, agreed is um, that 2024 is, is, a, is a possibly um, momentous year for the transatlantic relationship. Everyone is looking um, with some worry towards the US presidential elections uh, on November the 5th, um, and the outcome of which might, might uh, have quite, quite a big consequence for transatlantic relations. Um, to discuss this, um, two panelists I would like to introduce to you. Um, um, we are very honored um, to have um, uh, Anna Winger with us, um, an American-British writer, novelist, producer, and creator of global hit television series, including Deutschland 38, um, sorry, 83. Okay. <laughs> Big difference. It was you do 38. I, I do, do apologize. <laughs> Deutschland 83, unorthodox and transatlantic which is honoring or sort of focusing on, on a figure, um, Varian Frey, who's, um, if you pass Potsdamer Platz, you, you heard the name, at least, and Transatlantic is sort of, um, is about his efforts to, um, uh, to rescue uh, Jewish, um, uh, Germans in particular, to, to the United States. Inter alia, Anna has received an Emmy, a Peabody, and an Adolf Grimmer Award for her work. She's the founder of Airlift Productions and lives in Berlin, and since we are doing a fishbowl, I wondered what kind of fish Anna could be, um, and I turned uh, to an expert on these things, uh, my son. And after summarizing Anna's CV, he said that she would be a parrot fish on account on right. its amazing colorfulness, signaling extraordinary creativity. So welcome oh, to the fish bowl, so Anna. Nice, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we also um, uh, honored to have uh, Stephen Erlanger with us, who is chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times now based in Berlin since uh, last August, after six years in Brussels, starting in 2017. Before that, he was the New York Times Bureau Chief in London from 2013 to 17, after five years as Bureau Chief in Paris, and before that, four years as Bureau Chief in Jerusalem. And this is not his first time in Berlin. He previously served as Berlin Bureau Chief too, also as Bureau Chief for Central Europe and the Balkans, working out of Prague, Earlier, he was chief diplomatic correspondent based in Washington, D.C., and before that, he was reporting from Moscow in the early 1990s, after since in Southeast Asia, and I could go on for a long time. Um, this is all very impressive. Um, he has uh, two Pulitzers under his belt, in addition to various other honors and awards, which include having been made a Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur in 2013. And if he were a fish, <laughs> my son's verdict was blue shark ah. on account uh, of the blue shark being one of the fish with the widest range across the globe's oceans to be found almost everywhere. So welcome to the fish bowl, <laughs> Stephen. Thank you, sir. Before we start and, and, and involve you as well in the fish bowl, maybe let's start with a very briefly trying to gauge the transatlantic relationship as it, as it is today. When Joe Biden came in um, in early 2021, there were high hopes in, in Europe, in Germany in particular, um, of a revival of the transatlantic relationship after the nightmare of the Trump years. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's a mixed bag if you, if you look at, at uh, expectations and, and what has been achieved under, under the Biden presidency and also with Europe responding to, to what um, America had to offer. And uh, maybe starting with you, Anna, sort of what is your your feeling, your take of the state of the transatlantic relationship? Well, I think, you know, I'm seeing it from within my own industry and my own uh, creative life. And I have, you know, I'm sort of in my work, I sit on a bridge between Germany and the United States and the way um, the projects that I'm making. And I actually feel like there's a very close relationship. There's a lot of openness to what we're doing here. I would even say that there's more openness on the American side to what we're doing here than ever before. There's a lot of American projects that are being shot here, um, uh, movies and television. And, um, and then, you know, there were three Germans who were nominated for Academy Awards this year. The Oscar season really featured them. Um, I feel like there's, 
kind of excitement about what we're doing here and a kind of discovery on, the, on their side. So, and I see that also, frankly, in the art world. So it's, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not arguing with you, but I, I would say there are also positive things happening, mm. certainly in, in my part. And of what's your explanation? World. Why is, 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 is Europe, why is Germany sort of more interesting today than it might have been earlier? That's an interesting question. Like, why now? I mean, part of it, um, of course, specifically in my industry, um, there was a lot of, there was a big, there was two big strikes in the United States last year in, in Hollywood. Uh, there was an actor strike and a writer strike. And I think there was this uh, sort of many months of time in which people had the time possibly to sort of think about what was happening elsewhere. So that might have contributed to it. Um, but obviously there's also global streaming, there's, there's a, the change in the way we consume TV and movies, which has maybe made, um, there's even a difference, I mean, it's gonna sound so simple, but the fact that people meet over Zoom levels the playing field in terms of who, you, you know, you don't have to be living in Beverly Hills to have a meeting with someone in Beverly Hills, right? So that, I think there's ways in which creativity, you know, people are always interested in what each other are doing if they have access to it. And there's been more and more access to, and that creates opportunities for cross-pollination creatively. Thank you. Um, Stephen, do you agree, sort of, what's your take on the temperature? Um, I agree on the art world. I mean, I think mm -hmm. things like, Netflix have made, you know, people like me and, and, and others who are interested in more niche things or more interesting things and don't want to watch cartoon characters on screen all the time. It makes it much more interesting, to be sure. And Anna's been one of those people who have fed that very, very nicely. On the political side, I think it's nicht so schlimm. I think you, you know, what's changed is the Ukraine war. Um, and the Ukraine war has brought um, Europeans, I think, to understand again that America matters to them. Um, we're always going to have tensions. Um, I always th think of the Churchill line, it's better to hang together than hang separately unless that was Ben Franklin. I, I, it was one of those people that everyone misquotes all the time. Um, but I do think um, when you look at this German government, um, its connection to Washington is extraordinarily strong. Um, in a way, there's an enormous agreement between Schultz and Biden on Ukraine, on Russia, on how far to push what to be worried about. Um, there are trade issues that are always going to be a problem. I mean, Biden has kept the steel tariffs that Trump put on, bizarrely enough. Um, there's disagreements over China. Obviously, Germany has a very different uh, understanding of its national interests toward China than we do. I mean, we're a Pacific power. We worry about Taiwan. We worry about Japan. Germany is an export model, and, and, and China is crucial to it. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's no reason to think interests have to be the same. But I think, in general, we share um, a very strong view that the Western world is, is shrinking in size and in influence in a much more complicated world where there are real challenges from, I would call them regional imperialists, whether it's China or Turkey sometimes, certainly Russia. Um, the Mideast is an issue on which the US and Germany actually share very strong views, um, both about the survival of Israel, but also about real doubts about how the war in Gaza is actually being exercised. So I think the relationship is actually quite good. Um, and we both share, I think, you, you know, a rising kind of strange right-wing movements. I mean, every right-wing is different in every country. And you wouldn't say that Georgia Maloney is anything like Donald Trump or, or unlike the AFD, but I mean, there is a challenge, I think, to our assumptions about how democracies work got, um, going on here in America, in France, in 
in the Netherlands, uh, let alone Russia. So it's a complicated world, but I think we see ourselves as very strong allies. Mm. Before we can come to the sort of the, the, the right challenge, um, uh, in both both in America and, and, and Europe, um, there's also sort of been talk for some while that, that American society is changing, that um, you already mentioned America is a, is a Pacific power. There was under the Obama administration, there was a pivot to Asia, which <clears throat> is still sort of, that's put it politely, incomplete. Um, um, but is this something which sort of structurally turns the United States sort of automatically away from, from Europe? Or, or would you say um, there's no such automatic? Um, no, it's not automatic. It's just that we would like Europe to take care of itself. You know, because we can't take care of everyone all the time. And yet, you know, as much as we try to encourage this, actually, on Ukraine, it's been America that's had to pull it together with help from the EU, from Ursula von der Leyen, etc. On um, Israel Gaza, it's the US again that's had to pull it together. And I think the US has other fish to fry since we're in the fishbowl. And um, it would like to share more responsibility. And Europe talks endlessly about doing more. So I'd like to see it personally do more. It is doing more, obviously, particularly since 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. That was the great wake-up call. Then there was the invasion of Ukraine, which really set the alarms off, but I think people have hit the snooze button. And um, this is what worries me very, very much. So, yeah, I mean, also the United States, I mean, just last thing, I mean, it's, it, it, Demographically, it's a very different country than 30, 40 years ago. It's it's minority white now. It's 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 not a European country. Full stop. Um, and in terms of racial relations, in terms of Hispanics, in terms of migration, I mean, it's just it's different. So, you have, so even the Republican and Democratic parties are radically different from what they looked like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that has great implications, I think, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And do you also see this in your field, that that um, sort of changing US, changing US society, changing, I don't know, values sort of also impact um, the world of film, television production. It's interesting. I hadn't thought of it the way you just described it, that it's no longer, the United States is no longer a European country. Um, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. I, I think that, you know, the United States still sets the bar in a way for, in the industry. So there's a lot of ways in which the United States influences what is done creatively in Europe in terms of film and television specifically. Um, but not, but also in terms of how um, questions of identity politics are, are raised and dealt with. I mean, I think there is a very open discussion in the United States that does, does transfer here um, in, in the kind of stories that people are telling that's actually, it's a, in, in a way, I think the United States sets a positive tone for exploring all kinds of things on fil in film and television mm. in, a, in a good way. Um, but of course, I see what you're saying about, about politics. I mean, that we have, similar in, in, we have similar things going on in both countries mm. in terms of the development of the, the right. It, maybe it plays out differently because our societies are different, but we're grappling with similar issues at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's about time to, uh, to, to uh, invite a, a few <laughs> guest fishes to our podium. I've always seen some, some, some volunteers. Uh, okay. Rachel Tausendfreund is one. Maybe you, you want to join us. Um, and uh, um, while Rachel is coming on stage, maybe one quick question, sort of how worried are you um, looking, looking forward to, um, uh, to the elections? How much of I'm completely stress? neutral. You're completely neutral. What can neutral? I tell you? No, I mean, it's, I, I honestly don't think we'll know until October how it's going to go. Hmm. I think we should stop making ourselves crazy. Okay. Mark Rutte said the other day we should, that Europe should do what it knows it needs to do for its own sake that is not really mm. about Trump, but it's about more defense spending, it's about yeah. waking up more to a generational threat 
from Russia, from uh, Xi Jinping in, in China, to a digital transformation of industry, to decline of, of a certain kind of exports. I mean, these are things that have nothing to do with Donald Trump. Mm. And I think people forget that, you know, after Obama, it was Donald Trump that brought an American tank brigade back to Europe that Obama had pulled out, and that it was Trump who gave Ukraine weapons, which Obama refused to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a simple-minded picture. I mean, in some ways, the words are scary, and we don't know, you know, if he's going to be reelected or not. I, I, I don't bet on it. Again, I think we have nine months before we have to know one way or another, and we shouldn't make assumptions. Do you share this, Anna? So I agree. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's really very unclear what happens next, mm. and we have to wait and see. Mm. And now, uh, Rachel Tausenfreund, uh, who is, uh, full disclosure, um, my predecessor, actually, <laughs> editing uh, uh, a previous incarnation of, of uh, the English edition of International Politik. Uh, Rachel now is a uh, um, senior fellow uh, at the German Marshall Fund of the United States uh, with the geostrategic geo strategy team. Yes. And um, so, Rachel, please join us. Thanks, Henning. Yeah, so Henning's going to be nice to me. That's the disclosure here. But... Um, so I have, uh, specifically for you, Anna, because you are a parrotfish in, in these circles, right? We talk all, all day about transatlantic relations from a sort of political angle. Um, but, you know, cultural policy, there's, you know, culture has actually a very strong role in politics. And I have a two-part question for you, and that way you can skip one if, oh, you, yeah. if you want. Um, but, I mean, all of your projects have been pretty transatlantic. I mean, now the last one obviously even bears the name. Um, is that just by virtue of you sort of, you know, being an American in Berlin, or to what extent do political questions involved in the art interest you? How much do you think about it when you're thinking about a project? In term and you know, I specifically think about this with transatlantic. I mean, there's a there's one can read a lot of really important political messages into what is also a very fun show, um, and I just wonder, do you think about that at all? Related second part of the question is because uh, we were talking about the pivot to Asia, and there's a lot of talk about sort of Hollywood focusing now a lot on the Chinese market. Oh. Um, your projects are obviously, you know, slightly more niche, maybe one could say. Do you think about the different audiences? Do you have a sort of European audience in mind, American audience in mind, or do you, I don't know, you know? Um, okay, so first part, I think I'm a total news junkie. I mean, I, I've read so much of Stephen's work, it's kind of crazy. I, 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 um, I, yes, so I do think about the politics of the projects that I'm attracted to. I'm, I, think I'm, I think even when you're writing about the past, you're writing about the present. Um, I'm, what I'm writing, you know, with whether it was Deutschland at 83 or Transatlantic, of course, is informed by what I'm Current, what we're currently experiencing, uh, um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about while I'm writing it about contemporary life. Um, and wait, the second part of your question was? The audience. The audience. audience do you think? I don't actually think that much about the audience in terms of geography. I don't, I just don't see it like that. I feel like the sort of the great thing about Netflix, for example, as a broadcaster or a streamer is that, um, the, the, pro the project can find its audience where the audience is, you know? And I don't, I don't think that we see, as audience members, as a viewer, I don't see it only through my national, through a national filter. So to me, you know, the sort of aggregate of niche audience in the whole world is a lot of people. And it's kind of a miracle as someone who's creating content to be able to find those people wherever they are, whether they're in, you know, Japan or Saudi Arabia or Argentina. It's the people who respond to the work you know, it's just incredible that they can see it and that they can respond to it also, you know, whether it's through social media or by, or by sending notes. So, I mean, in two parts, I think it's very complicated to design something for an audience, you know, and I, I don't personally do, do it like that. I think if I'm interested enough in something and if it feels relevant enough to me that there must be other people who feel that way as well, you know, and, that I, I, and the goal is always to... Um, to find them, to make it entertaining enough, but substantive, substantive enough that they can relate to it. 
Thank you. Um, there was another fish uh, volunteer over there, and then there's a lady over there. And since I don't, don't know you as well as <laughs> I, I happen to know Rachel, please introduce yourself. Sure, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pretty happy to be up here now. And um, my name is Markus Schwenke. Um, I'm from the German Federation of Wholesale and Foreign Trade. Um, that's a pretty big federation representing 138,000 German uh, trading companies, importing companies, and exporting companies. And um, I think it's quite obvious that I want to reroute the, 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 the topic back to trade. And um, for our members, um, the United States obviously is, is a very, very important market um, f for, for um, selling products, but also a very important sourcing markets. And that's, that's why uh, our members also depend heavily on, on market access. Um, they depend heavily on uh, free trade and the WTO. Uh, rules and uh, we, are, we are a bit worried. Uh, we are in a worrying modus for, or mode for the last uh, years and um, we are now of course looking very closely at what's happening at the election. And um, you ask about the state of the, of the, of the relations and um, I, I think the temperature is rising a little bit. I can, I can feel that and um, I was wondering, and this is maybe a question to, to, to both of you, um, because you have deep insights. Um, um, when Donald Trump uh, was president, uh, we saw the steel and aluminum tariffs. Our members were heavily uh, impacted by the balancing measures of the European Union or the countermeasures, um, because they are importing a lot of products. And at that time, we realized that there was uh, some opposition in the United States. There were a lot many downstream industry uh, companies that, that, um, that said that these, uh, these uh, tariffs on European products and other products, uh, they would be also harmful for them um, because they need to, the prices were rising and they needed to produce uh, maybe cans or other products. Um, so wh where's this opposition now? Um, I, I don't hear anything anymore. Is there a significant opposition uh, to, to the uh, protectionist lobby? Um, and is, will they play a role in the, in the upcoming election? Steve, um, I'm not a trade expert and I'm not there, but the one thing I do know about Biden and the Democratic re-election campaign, um, he said he wanted a foreign policy for the middle class. That was his line. And he was very eager to restore the faith of trade unionists in America in the Democratic Party and in their relationship to traditional industry. So I guess that's why he kept these tariffs, though to me they made no sense. I mean, they were aimed at China, not at um, Europe. I mean, I talked the other day to the DG for trade in, in Brussels, Sabine Veyon, who's very, very smart and knows what she's doing. And she's very worried about how security has become the new prism for regulating trade. I don't think that has much to do with cans, but it has a lot to do with AI and chips and other things. And she's very worried that this will produce a new protectionism. Um, again, probably first aimed at China. But you see, you know, the American pressure on the Netherlands, for instance, with ASML, I mean, other issues. So I think this is going to be around. I mean, this, this, the security prism uh, will stay, and the WTO is not really functioning, right? And, and, and part of the reason it's not functioning is because of climate issues, and India doesn't want to discuss climate issues inside the, the WTO, which frustrates the EU. So I think these tensions are real, and um, God knows I have no idea what a Trump would do. I mean, it depends on what his stomach tells him that particular morning and what person he puts in charge of trade. I mean, we do know he seems to have an abiding, strange dislike for Germany. I don't know whether it was because of Merkel or whether it because of his 
grandfather who wasn't allowed back into the country, a Herr Drumpf. I mean, but for whatever, or maybe it's because he hated all the German cars on American streets. There are lots of reasons, and he certainly felt Germany for a long time was free riding on, a, on American military spending. So if I were Germany, I would, you know, look at a Trump re-election with some concern, uh, people talking about it. But on trade, I think it's all, it's really more about China, China, China. Mm. But, but if you talk to, to, to people in the Chancery, they will tell you that um, the, their, their line of argument will be, well, we, all the complaints uh, Trump put forward in his four years, um, we have now good answers to them. Sort of, If you look at the 2% spending goal, we, this has been fulfilled the, for the first time now. Trade deficit um, no longer there, also, or, or not as pronounced as it was. The German economy is, is weaker. Um, do you think these, these kind of um, arguments will convince? It depends on how he wakes up in the morning, frankly. Mm. I mean, you, you know, Trump is famous for saying his stomach is smarter than a thousand experts. So <laughs> I don't know what his stomach will be saying. I mean, seriously, I mean, he's, he's very unpredictable and he's mm. very transactional, mm. right? So yes, if you do this for me, I get this. Mm. Um, his, his argument about NATO was always about spending, even mm. though he still has in his brain this idea that NATO is a club that people pay dues to, mm -hmm. which is an ide fix in his head that he will never get away mm. from. But I mean, people are doing more, more, mostly because of Russia than because of Trump. But if you frame things in terms of transactional policies, that's what Trump likes. I mean, and Trump likes to feel like he's won and he likes to be flattered. So, I mean, I think we know how to deal with Trump, mm. um, but which Trump arrives or doesn't arrive depends on lots of things. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe on, on, the, on the general question of trade, though, is, isn't it that this sort of, um, I, th I think the, the, it's uh, common sense, uh, both parties in, in the United States now say a sort of uh, free trade agreements, um, sort of, or, or trade agreements, the, in the old style, sort of, that's not what we want well, to do is, anymore. This has and, been true for a long time. I mean, you know, we mm. now have a national industrial policy, and this mm. bothers some people. I don't know why it bothers the French. The French have had national industrial policy <laughs> for an awfully long time, mm. but this is where we are. This is the economy for the middle class and the foreign policy for the middle class. I don't think that's going to change. Mm. Is it in, 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 in terms of, of cultural relations, is, is, sort of, is this sort of openness uh, to each other, is that also an issue? Or um, do you think sort of the way regulations are set uh, could be improved? Or? Well, I, I, there's a funny irony in the fact that the most, um, the area that has the most unions in the United States, or like the most successful union, maybe not the most, but a big union area is film. Whereas in Germany, there are no unions, not really not active or powerful unions uh, related to what we do here. So one of the barriers for us in terms of like actually working together has to do with how do you bring non-union structure together with union structure in, in the US. So. Um, it's too complicated to get into it here, but it's like if an American show is shooting here, there's always the, there's, a, there's all these union questions, and it's ironic because the Americans are the union side and the Germans are the non-union side, right? It's like you wouldn't expect that. So I think there are definitely different ways of doing things that are that are uh, regulated that that make it. Yeah, of course, there's things that come come between us. Um, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to say exactly what version of a second Trump administration would look like. And I also think it's very difficult to assume right now that that's going to happen. So I, I would proceed with caution on that front. <laughs> All right. I hope that that was sort of uh, uh, um, uh, answered your question to at least to some extent. Um, it, it did. Yes. Thank you very much. Excellent. And I think I had another volunteer over there. Yes, oh. the lady over there. So if you sort of thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And if you could introduce yourself as well, please. My name is Diana Luna. Um, I'm Latin America Policy Advisor for the Nauman Foundation for Freedom. 
And as you mentioned, America is not a European country anymore. And talking about migration and having the, the, the coming elections in the States, but also in the European Parliament, um, I would like to know if you see similar approaches to talk about migration. Um, my opinion, I, I am, yeah, I've never seen that migration has taken such an important role in the American politics, especially in this election. And a lot of people thought it would be a change from Biden policy, from Biden administration, from Trump, but that has not been the case. Mm -hmm. And migration also, it's an important issue on, on the, on the, in film industry, on, on, yeah. on entertainment industry. So I would like to, you to, I would like to know from your perspective, do you see similar concerns in Europe and in the States regarding migration and how that plays a role on the coming elections? Um, yes, is the short answer, um, but it speaks to a larger anxiety I think we have a harder time understanding, which is a world that's transforming industrially, which means the workforce is transforming, uh, where there are new religious tensions, I would say, in the world. Um, where there's more anxiety about national identity. Um, it's fine to have an EU that's a kind of shared sovereignty and a melting pot, but it's a much bigger, more diverse EU than ever before. You feel the strains already in Brussels. Migration is one of the big issues because Europe is not used to this. I mean, it just isn't. It's new phenomenon, and it's going to happen more and more because of desertification, because of um, richer people around the periphery, because Europe's a very attractive place to live. It's a bourgeois paradise to some degree, and people see it on their phones, and they say, yeah, I'd like some of that. Thank you very much. And so how you control migration, because countries have to control it in some fashion. I mean, how you decide what you want. I mean, Germany wants engineers. Okay, fine. But not everybody coming from Syria is an engineer. Um, and so I think still you see the impact here, and I'm a foreigner to be sure, but you know, there's still the Wirtschaften das is still a very controversial issue here. I mean, I mean, what was the impact of this big migration, particularly of young Muslim men, to Germany? What impact has it had on politics, on the AFD, on, on all sorts of issues? And we see that in America, too, because um, um, the, the migration issue is being instrumentalized by Trump Republicans. Uh, most Americans, I think, still recognize we're a country of migration. Right? Um, and, but when Trump comes out and, as he said the other day, that some migrants aren't people, he said, and then he said they come speaking languages no one's ever heard of, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, the tone is ugly and different, um, but it, it speaks to this larger anxiety. You see it in America, let's see, even in the relationship between American blacks and American Hispanics. I mean, there's a lot of tension over who gets what and who's doing better. Um, and, and that's fine in a big country, but these larger issues, you see it in the Netherlands, you see it in Italy. I mean, you, you know, the right is, the right is built on, I, to, well, to me, this is too simple-minded, but some of the right is built on anxiety and fear of foreigners and of a culture that's being changed and shifted in a way in Europe it hasn't since, you know, maybe 200 years ago. So it's, it's, I think there are similarities. It's a long answer, but it's a very complicated question. It interests me a lot. I mean, I spent a lot of time in France um, writing about the banlieue and uh, laicite and identity. And, and I mean, these are issues that really go to the heart of national culture and sense of belonging um, and the anxiety of, of maintaining a way of life when 
our economic models are turning upside down, I think add to this issue. So that's a long answer. I apologize for that. Anna, do you also want to come in? I mean, as, as someone who migrated to Berlin. It's true, although I'm not a German citizen because it's still too difficult to become German and American. Right. They keep promising me that that's going to be possible, but I'm waiting for, for that to actually happen. So if this is my chance to say it, <laughs> you know, I'm waiting for double der Staatsbürgerschaft to be something real for Americans. So I've lived here for 21 years. I've paid a lot of taxes. I've produced two German children. So I think I'm entitled. I've also promoted this country worldwide. Um, so I, I'm, I'm waiting for, for that phone call. But yeah, so maybe that's, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> but I lived for many years in Mexico growing up. I think about Latin America a lot. And it is interesting how far away Latin America feels from, from here. It, it's, you know, when you're in the United States, it feels so close. It's so much a part of American culture and, and less so here. So it's interesting to hear your perspective. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes left, and there's another candidate to join the fishbowl. Thank you very much for your question. And if there's someone else who would like to join after that. Hello, welcome to the fishbowl. Please I've obviously never done this before because I conveniently sat myself <laughs> in the middle of a row, so apologies <laughs> for that. Uh, Brandon Bourne from the Bertelsmann Stiftung. I work in our Europe program on our transatlantic team. I have a question for you, Anna. Uh, so I came from Washington. We have an office there, Bertelsmann does, and a project that I worked on for a few years um, was uh, transatlantic trends, actually with the German Marshall Fund. So. Shout out to Rachel again. Uh, this is an annual survey publication that polls 12 European countries, the United States and Canada. And a very worrying trend that we saw year after year was that on questions about reliability, especially um, how reliable do you view uh, the United States or Europe, you know, both directions, younger generations, you know, those belonging to my generation uh, don't view Europe as reliable as older generations do, and you know you can theorize on why that is. Um, for for a number of reasons, the cultural connections or the connections generally that uh, older generations, especially in Europe, have with the United States and vice versa, it's just you know it's, it's rooted in the Cold War. The, the Marshall Plan doesn't mm -hmm. resonate with mm -hmm. younger generations, especially in Europe today. When looking at the United States, so I'm curious um, in your work. Uh, you know the, the the types of products that you're you're developing. Uh, to what extent are you engaging? Do you feel like you're engaging the next generation of transatlanticists? And maybe zooming the lens out a little bit. Uh, to what extent? What value do you place on the cultural transatlantic connections when maybe politics at the national level are not are, are less than ideal? I mean, I, I listen, I think entertainment can be very important to, to cutting through those lines. I mean, it's, you know, we're not playing the same instruments as like, let's say the news or, you know, it's, it's we're telling stories that are first and foremost entertaining, you know, um, they're set, but they're still set in a political world. And it's a way, I think, of the kind of storytelling that I do, I think is a way of making, um, let's say, political issues or sociocultural issues accessible to young people. So I, if that's what you're asking, I think that's important, yeah. And in terms of the transatlantic relationship, I mean, I made a series called Deutschland 83, actually for Bertelsmann. <laughs> and um, it was for RTL and for UFA. And um, it was, you know, it represented a sort of struggle for what the future would look like in Germany, and that uh, the United States played a you know, big role in that story across the series. We did 83, 86, and 89. Um, and I, but I do see this work as a kind of vehicle for explore, also bringing um, young people into the stories of the past. You know, when we used to tell, when we used to go around talking about the show, um, for young people, it really sounds like a science fiction, right? It's like, imagine a world, Berlin is divided, there's a wall, the people in the East can't get out, you know? It just, it, it, for them, it's unimaginable, really. And um, 
but to explore those stories um, in an entertaining way, in a character-driven way, brings young people into an understanding of what came before them. You know, the, when you're young, you think that it's the beginning of history. We, history begins with you. And there's, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but I think it's Mark Twain said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And it's, you know, that's something that I, that I think about a lot in, in the work that I do. So I hope that's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have two more hands up, I think, over there. Gentlemen over there and then there. Maybe you can move already um, closer to the, to the podium, then we um, can sort of uh, make use of every minute we have left. <laughs> okay, right. So we've got three, three more to join us. Thank Please. you. Yeah. Um, I'm Friedrich Paulsen, representative of the German Savings Banks Group. My question is, there was a slight critique on the tariffs introduced by Biden and you framed it, you called it a middle-class focused policy. And I, I agree from the perspective of trade, it's not positive. However, I question myself, um, is there a positive political payoff to expect from these policies? Because the shrinking of middle class is um, among a lot of books and, and, and literature um, called as a reason um, for, for the loss of belief in democratic systems. Yes. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. I don't know how many of you have managed to wade through Thomas Piketty's book, Capital. It's quite big. It's quite good. Um, you may not agree with his formulas, but his charts about what's happened to inequality since the Second World War are pretty shocking, particularly in Anglo-Saxon countries more, and in a way Germany sort of is close, it's a bit closer, but I mean, France being the European country that keeps the smallest gap still between the highest paid and lowest paid. But in America and in Britain, it's, it's, it's like this now because of the stock market, because of the tax structure. Um, and it's also true that it, um, middle class incomes have not risen nearly with inflation, that's been true of me too, by the way. My, my salary hasn't risen at all, in, as it should have. Um, <laughs> but I'm not really that's complaining, that's you know. <laughs> um, but in real terms, most people in what you would call the American middle class, the people who build the cars, who, did, who work in industries, are being paid in real terms less than they were 30 years ago. I mean, where... You know, if you worked building a car in Detroit, you could have two cars, you had a house, you could send your kids to college. Mm -hmm. Your wife didn't necessarily have to work. And this is not true anymore. So, I mean, some of this is absolutely real. And it's partly, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's happening here too, but I mean, everyone, there's this whole ar argument about loss of industrial jobs. Is it because of China? Well, partly it's about China. Partly it's just because of automation. Right? I mean, it's automation's done away with more traditional jobs than, than cheap Chinese goods have ever done. Um, but there is a challenge. So, I mean, one does feel that there are, there are uh, export controls going up in lots of places, um, and particularly in, in these sort of new technologies. So, I think you're right. I don't have an answer. I mean, as I say, I'm not an economist, but the the political impact is quite real. It's very strong, I think. Um, right. I don't know if that's what you were looking for. <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah, and, and it's, 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 it's consensus in the US, isn't it? It's, it's not a party political issue anymore. No, no, no. I mean, you know, when you look at what the Republicans used to be for, like free trade and so on, it's just not really true anymore. I mean, that's you know, funny. when we, I mean, why did the deal I can't, I always get confused between TTP and TTIP, but I mean... The Trans-Pacific. Yeah, it failed partly because um, the political will wasn't there, but it failed partly because we have such different ideas about regulation, um, and Germans, for the large part, don't trust Americans to regulate things properly. There's a whole different theory of regulation. You, you know, in America, we kind of let things go until people die 
and then we regulate. And here you regulate to make sure no one ever stubs, stubs their foot. And so in some ways it, it holds innovation back, but it creates a safer world possibly. Yeah, that was a TTIP um, project. TTIP, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, thank you very much for your question. We take the gentleman, and then we have the young voice to conclude. Welcome to the fishbowl. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Patterson, um, head of trade monitoring at the WTO. Um, for non-trade guides, Stephen, I think you captured pretty much <laughs> what, what, what things, uh, how things operate these days. Um, the WTO for like 70 years were more or less built on the fact that the Europeans and the Americans provided leadership. And we have a, a vacuum right now. And I'm trying to understand, so what happened interestingly uh, during the Trump administration compared to the subsequent uh, Biden administration is that the tone changed, but the policies didn't really. Um, I've often heard from friends in the US that a good day for them uh, politically is when trade does not appear anywhere on the news. Now, are we Europeans naive when it comes to what we expect and want from American leadership? Do we, do we under, and do the, so, because we think, I think as Europeans, we think that there is a common good and we think we know as Europeans what's good for the world. But are we naive about what the Americans think and what they think is their role in terms of providing leadership? Um, actually, I mean, it's very hard to say. Um, I think everybody's naive in the sense if you believe, I'm not saying this is what you believe, but that somehow trade is not political. Trade is political. Regulations are political. I mean, um, and I tried to speak about the anxieties working class people feel all over the place, but I think that gets reflected in our politics, which gets mm -hmm. reflected in our regulation and our export controls. I mean, we did this very good deal with Canada, Mexico, which I think was a, a very good deal. I don't know if it's the last one ever. I, I, I do know, I'm not an expert on the WTO, but I do know the sort of appellate court has been blocked and blocked and blocked. And, and even Sabine Veyon complained the other day to me that, you know, the problem with WTO is everyone complains about it, but nobody's putting real proposals to make it work. Um, and, you know, Pascal Lamy is kind of wringing his hands. <laughs> but, I mean, it still matters quite a lot. But, I mean, even when the Americans talk about China, you, you know, Jake Sullivan talks about putting a high fence around a small garden of, of protectionism, I think, from Europe, it's viewed as a garden the size of Texas. I mean, it's not a small garden at all. It's a big garden. <laughs> um, so naive, I think, is unfair. I think people are pretty realistic. But I think there's a lot of anger in Brussels about American policies, which, you know, they think are rightly a change from what America's policies were 20 years ago. Um, but as I say, I'm not sure that's going to change. Okay. Thank you very much. And our last participant. Welcome to the stage and um, you could introduce yourself. Please. Hi, and good morning. My name is Emilia Clarke and I'm an intern with the Aspen Institute. And um, I recently did my bachelor's degree in political science and international relations in Amsterdam. And I had the opportunity to go to Connecticut for a semester abroad. And something that I really noticed was a difference in, um, in optimism and in mentality. So in the US, I felt like there was an awareness of the issues with democratic backsliding. Um, there was an awareness of the issues in, in the system as well, and of the role of the US on the world stage, but there was still a sense of optimism and faith, and a sense of not giving up, and wanting to do the best to fix this, whereas in Amsterdam, it felt like a lot more skepticism, and um, 
some sort of a sense of resignation with looking towards the future of the transatlantic relationship as well. And I'm wondering if you have a similar impression and if you think we have reason to <laughs> be hopeful. Of course we have reason to be hopeful. I mean, there's always something we can do to make things, to improve things. I mean, I, of course I'm an American, but I think, yeah, I think you're right that there's a sort of predisposition towards optimism versus a predisposition towards pessimism for many reasons, you know, historical and otherwise. But um, of course we have reasons to be hopeful. I mean, I think the jury is not out on any of it, on, on how things are going to go. And there are wrinkles in history that improve, you know, and this, we're in a tight spot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that good things aren't going to come out of it. Do you disagree with me? Yeah, no, I mean, which part of Connecticut yeah. we in? I'm, I'm from Connecticut. That's my Rodina. So. <laughs> um, I was in Stars at the University of yeah. Connecticut. Uh, great basketball team. Yeah. <laughs> and known for its optimism? Or sort of well, you know, it's a, it's a college town. No, I do think generally <laughs> Americans, you, you, you know, lots of cliches back and forth, but you know, Americans see the world as open in, in general. And we have a much less regulated society, which was part of what we actually spoke about. And, and I think in America, people are, I mean, you can in, reinvent yourself. I, I mean, if you're basically obey the law and pay your taxes, you're an American. That's all you really have to do, right? I mean, and um, it's why I still think in many ways it is, a land of real opportunity, which is why so many people want to come there, which is why we have this problem over, over uh, migration. Um, and, you know, there's always an element of, you know, pessimism, and I, we can talk about all, all kinds of reasons. Um, but in general, I think that's my impression, too. I mean, that, I mean, there's still a sense in America the world is to be made, it's not finished. Um, while sometimes here I get the impression, certainly in smaller countries, I, you know, things are pretty striated. I mean, you're trying to work within a system that is pretty strict. Um, and, um, you know, again, that's an, an exaggeration. But, I mean, just look at the amount of venture capital in America and in Europe, for instance, it gives you a very good idea of how societies look differently at opportunity and at risk. Americans are much more willing to take risks, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. That's, those are my cliches, and I'm sticking <laughs> with <Yeah>. them. <laughs> well, cliche or not, I think uh, it's, it's good to the we end on, on a slightly optimistic note. Uh, yeah. um, uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Uh, for, uh, everyone who came, came up uh, and, and took part in the fishbowl. Um, but please uh, join me now in thanking our two panelists, Anna Winger and uh, Stephen Erlanger. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for being such an attendant audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.